they like. Yeah. Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, tonight's event in the calendar of the Northumberland Dark Sky Festival. Tonight, it's the Great Geordie Space Race with our wonderful guest speaker and astronomer and astronomy educator, David Hughes. Um, I'm Roy Alexander. I'm your host for the evening. Um, and as ever, I'm going to give you a little three or four minute introduction to the Northumberland Dark Sky Park and the wonderful uh, dark skies that we have. And then I'm going to hand you straight over to, uh, to David. Um, so, if you, you know, it's the usual, isn't it? We have to go and share our screen. If you bear with me whilst I do that, I'm sure there's probably some way you can all do this in advance, but um, maybe not. Slideshow. There we go. So if you have seen this before or one of our other events, I apologize. I'm just basically going to repeat um, what you've heard over the last uh, four or five nights. But if you haven't, uh, then welcome to the North London Dark Sky Festival. Um, <clears throat> this year, obviously, we're in right in the middle of a pandemic. And so um, everything's online, which is a shame, really, because, I mean, look at that picture there. That's one of Mark McNeil's uh, photographs of the um, much photographed, much imaged um, Sycamore Gap or the Kevin Costner tree. Um, and we have amazing skies up here. We would love to be seeing you, but unfortunately we're all shut in our houses and trying to keep the world safe. Um, so, you know, maybe next year or maybe even this year, we will be able to see you under our dark skies. And when we do, um, and when you do visit us, there are four now, four, count them, observatories in the Northumberland Dark Sky Park. And the first, um, the, the earliest established observatory is, as everybody knows, the Kielder Observatory, um, just outside the village of Kielder in the northwest of um, the Dark Sky Park. That's a wonderful picture there by Dan Monk over the observatory. Dan Monk's one of the astronomers there. Um, and this is one of the latest additions to the um, family of observatories. And this is Stonehof Astronomy and Stonehof Observatory. I say Stonehof Astronomy because that's who they are on um, Facebook if you want to Google them and um, look them up. And interestingly, Liam, who runs and practically built that place by hand, is also a um, part-time astronomer at Kielder. Um, then we have, I think, the most recent addition to the astronomy family in Northumberland, the Twice Brood Observatory um, at the Twice Brood Inn, right next door to the Sill Discovery Centre. It's a really great place, the Sill. Um, and obviously, you go there uh, on, a, on a weekend when you are allowed to come and visit. You can kill two birds with one stone, go visit Twice Brood in their observatory as well. And last but not least, the observatory I helped to design and build and that my team managed the Battlesteads Observatory in the village of Wark. Um, and we've been going now for five or six years. And this is a wonderful picture here by Dr. Martin Kitching, who did uh, the Nightscape talks that are now recorded, by the way. And you can watch those retrospectively um, on the playlist. Um, I mean, there's just so much going on in that picture. It's fantastic. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I can see quite a few of you said hello to us already in the YouTube live chat. That's fantastic. And I'm sure as, uh, as David takes us through this uh, wonderful journey of Geordie um, space race astronomy type things, you'll have questions. Um, and I suspect that for once, I will not be able to answer any or many of them. So uh, if you do want to ask questions, I will jot them down in my notepad and I will fire them at Dave either halfway through or somewhere towards the end. And please, please, please be kind, be nice in your comments. Um, very final slide from me. The thing about dark skies, it's, it's a global movement um, and it affects all kinds of things, human health, habitats, decarbonisation, and of course, astronomy. And the International Dark Sky Association is the global not-for-profit organisation that supports all of us. Um, I'm an IDA delegate and um, you can join the IDA. You can pay a small membership fee and join. Um, or you can donate, and there are various things going on that the IDA do around the world. So head over to their website at the end of this presentation and check them out and give them a like on, uh, on, on Twitter and a follow. Uh, thank you for listening to me again. <laughs> um, I'm going to shut that down. Ooh, if I can get to the end of that, that should be my screen not shared anymore. Um, and I'm going to hand you over to um, David, who is sharing his screen right now. Thank you. Take it away, David. 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know if you can hear me. I hope you can hear me, right? Does everything sound good? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly loud and clear. Good. We can see good. your presentation. We can hear you. And I'm watch, okay. watching the live stream in, in, in on my phone and it looks absolutely marvellous. OK, well, welcome to the Great Geordie Space Race, Northumberland Dark Skies Festival. You have to forgive me for a few seconds while I get my brain running up to speed. It's been a long day. OK, something wonderful has been happening in the last few days. This is a really fantastic time to be an astronomer. Absolutely marvellous things happening all the time, whether you've been following SpaceX and their rotten Starlink satellites or their... Uh, beasties going up into space, the, st the spaceship, starship. Absolutely amazing stuff going on at the moment. Um, over the weekend, the United Arab Emirates managed to put one of their little beasties into orbit around Mars. The first picture we got back, breathtaking. I looked, I went, woohoo, shield volcanoes. You can see the shield volcanoes from orbit. How good is that? Shows the quality of their optics. Good look to them. The Chinese, they've got one of their beasties up there as well. The Tianwen-1 mission to arrive around Mars, absolutely brilliant. To my mind, the best happens tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening. Something wonderful is gonna happen when NASA's Perseverance rover starts heading towards the Martian surface. And this is all gonna to happen tomorrow afternoon. Looking forward to it. I probably won't be able to watch it in, in real time. I'll probably be too chicken to watch it because to, pull, to go through that, you've got to go through seven minutes of hell absolute hell is this little spacecraft, this little blue Martian rover, falls through the Martian atmosphere, has to endure a very tenuous thin atmosphere before it starts to even get close to the Martian surface, jumps, gets rid of the, uh, the heat shield, starts a slow parachute descent down to slow it down to sort of normal sort of speeds, disregards the parachutes, gets shot at the parachutes, and then magic happens. This thing called the sky crane takes over and flies this Martian rover down to the surface. This is the stuff that I grew up with as a kid. This is Thunderbirds made real. Jerry Anderson would love this. Lowers this little rover, which is about the size of a Land Rover, perhaps a little bit bigger, to the surface and then gently crashes onto the Martian surface some distance away. So you've got this little thing about the size of a Land Rover trundling around the surface of Mars, doing the most wonderful science. And yet none of this would have been possible without Geordies in space, without the great Geordie space race. I am a passionate advocate of the contribution that Geordie, and not just Geordie, not just people made in Newcastle, but people from the northeast of England have made to our knowledge of space, our knowledge of astronomy. I don't just mean them. Perhaps Robson Green. Cut him a bit of slack, Robson Green. Geordie in space, yes, definitely him. He's a passion for rockets, which I also share. And this is something you know you don't know about unless you dig beneath the surface. And that's what this talk is all about. It's digging beneath the surface, perhaps ignoring established history and going to look for yourself, finding some stuff out. Proper Geordies in space, for instance, Arthur Holmes, born in heaven. Jeremiah Dixon down the road from me in a little place called Cockfield, County Durham. Thomas Backhouse from Sunderland. The Venerable Bede, again from Sunderland. Other astronomers, Thomas Wright for Aura, Bishop Auckland, Sir Harold Jeffries down in Fatfield, Washington, James Cook, Middlesbrough, George Bidleri from Annick. And then we've got the Honourable Geordies who were born somewhere else and then came to this region to make a difference. Reverend Esping, Keith Runcorn, William Herschel, nonetheless, spent a short amount of time in the northeast of England. Paul Davies, the renowned science author, was my tutor, at my, well, my personal tutor at university. Wow. Think about that on your first day at university, you meet Paul, wonderful. Others like Sir Charles Parsons, born in Ireland. R.S. Newell from Glasgow. Howard Grubb, also from Ireland. Alexander Herschel, born in South Africa, came to Newcastle to do most of his serious work on meteorites. So that's the people we're gonna be talking about tonight. Where to start, where to start? Well, there's only one place we really can start. We have to go back 1300 years to the Venerable Bede, or Beda. Let's we think how his name was pronounced back then. We're not sure when he was born, 762, 763. History books are a little bit vague. The calendar's a little bit vague. But we do know that Bede was born to a fairly well-to-do family. He was fairly well-educated when he went off to uh, become a monk. He spent most of his time shuttling between two different um, monasteries, one in Monk Weirmouth, the other, uh, I think, uh, where was it, Jarrow? 
yes, Jara, sorry, brain freeze there for a second. And Bede produced some of the most useful, interesting contributions to early astronomical knowledge. And he's world renowned, world famous, and his methods are still used today, a variation of them. His book on the reckoning of time is absolutely smashing for a scientist, for, a, for astronomers figuring out how the universe worked. Bede was the first person to really work out the relationship between the tides and the daily motion of the moon and how those tides might arise. He worked out the instructions for calculating the date of Easter, which is based on an earlier method. The Hebrew calendar uses a system for, which is very similar, but Bede extended it and made it a bit more accurate. And the date for Easter is defined as the first Sunday following the first full moon, following the spring equinox. And we still use a variation of that today. Minor variations, but it's still consistent. Bede also used events in the Old Testament to calculate the date of creation. And we don't believe that sort of thing, but what's crucial is that Bede used certain astronomical events, time group, genuine historical events. The Exodus from Egypt is well known. Joshua's longest day coincides almost exactly with um, a partial solar eclipse over the Middle East in about 1405. BC. So that's what Bede used to calculate this new date for creation. Got him into a lot of trouble, was accused of being a heretic. Well, that's some bad news in those days because, well, it could end very badly. Bede, being a clever man, got off with it. And also the prosecuting judge, Bishop Plaguin, didn't know much about astronomy. So, well, Bede got away with it. And he's still celebrated today. Bede, good old Bede, he's interred in Durham Cathedral, which is five miles down the road from me. And every time I'm in Durham, if I'm near the cathedral, pop in to say hello and remember his contribution because it really is that important. Very, very important. We need to get into a time machine now and skip forward in time for about a thousand years quite some distance into the future. It's called the Dark Ages for a reason. There doesn't seem to be much good astronomy done in this part of the world for about another thousand years. We'll skip forward, no, not to 1911, where West Auckland football team won the uh, 1911 World Cup, but we'll stay in Bishop Auckland and talk about the so-called Bishop Auckland Quartet. It's a really puzzling array of astronomers and mathematicians and th theologians who got together who all seem to be around in Bishop Auckland. You might actually wonder what was in the water supply in Bishop Auckland at that time. To give rise to so many astronomers, surveyors, engineers, who all knew each other. Jeremiah Dixon should be probably one of the best known ones. William Emerson, a mathematician. John Bird, instrument maker to the crown. Thomas Wright, natural philosopher. They all knew each other. They all worked together at various times. Um, they were not all this, exactly the same age, but of it, they were all around at the same time. Of this four, the best known is perhaps Thomas Wright. He was born in a little village, Byers Green, which is not far from Bishop Auckland. Um, it's quite a small little hamlet, quite a pleasant little hamlet off the beaten track. And you can still visit the remains of uh, Thomas Wright's house because he moved back there when the, uh, at, at his retirement. He had a troubled early life. We believe he had some kind of a speech impediment. impediment. That wasn't a Freudian slip, that was just a slip, a speech impediment. He had a somewhat undisciplined attitude to life and his studies. He had a difficult relationship with women for a start. We'll go into that in another story of this time. To avoid trouble with women, he ran away to sea, immediately discovered that he's violently seasick and cannot spend life as he'd intended, touring the world, visiting all sorts of faraway countries and having romantic adventures. He just cannot stay, he's got to stay on land. He returns to England after a brief stay in Amsterdam, sets up a school for mathematics and navigation in Sunderland, but that doesn't seem to last very long. The venture fails or he gets bored. It's a little bit unclear what happens. And he eventually becomes employed as a companion to the rector of Sunderland, one Daniel Newcomb. And you might think that that's where the story ends, but there's more trouble with a lady friend that goes badly wrong and never mind. But it's whilst he's working for Newcomb that he's introduced to Sir Richard Lumley, the second Earl of Scarborough. If you know the northeast of England, that is Lumley Castle. Again, not far down the road from me. Richard Lumley, second Earl of Scarborough. And Lumley is so impressed by Wright's skill as an orator, as a mathematician, as an instrument maker, as a theoretician, that he invites Wright down to London to address the Lords of the Admiralty, who are 
taxed with the most vexing of problems, which is the longitude problem, how to determine your position accurately at sea. And they invite Wright to start making contributions in that area. The Lords are equally impressed and they agree to support the publication of Wright's major work, a book. We're not actually sure what the Panopticon really is. Is it a book? It's a set of tables. Is it some kind of physical device that you can pick up with your hands and, and play with? We're not sure because very, very few are actually still left. There's a French group trying to reassemble, rebuild some kind of mechanical clockwork device that Wright seems to have built, but nothing survives that we know of to this day. Wright moves himself to London. He obviously sees an opportunity to better himself down in London. He throws himself into the Georgian so-called Coffee House Society and gets fat and disagreeable on bad oysters, as far as we can tell. He earns money from lecturing on astronomy, maths, geometry, a few political theories certainly gets money, earns money on his religious theories as well, talking about how he thinks the nature of the universe and the cosmos relate to scriptures. A very important part of his life. He's a very religious man. The map maker, the famous map maker of that time, John Asenix, John Asenix, is incredibly impressed with Wright's skills as a draftsman and commissions Wright to produce a series of maps which Senex will then publish. And that means that Wright's maps will go around the world with seafarers. They're known all over the world. Wright is becoming a very hot property. His skills as an instrument maker earn him a formidable reputation amongst the landed gentry who want his services to decorate their new houses that they built, their new rich. They've suddenly got money, they can throw money at instruments, at wall hangings, at panellings, with some kind of scientific bent. Meanwhile, subscribers, the list of subscribers to Wright's Panopticon suddenly goes through the roof. It becomes a hot property to invest in. You could invest in a book. It's kind of like a Kickstarter campaign to make sure that a book gets published. Lumley somehow, which is very, very rare, obtains permission for Thomas Wright to dedicate this book, Panopticon, to King George II, which is a major achievement. The Prince Regent also becomes an important subscriber. And I know a lot of people are down on the Prince Regent and they don't have much good to say about him, but he was quite an important, a well-educated, well-considered man. Panopticon is a major success on publication. And suddenly Thomas Wright is incredibly in demand. Somehow Thomas is put forward to be a member of the Royal Society. We'll come back to that shortly because I thought it was the next slide and it isn't. At the age of just 23, Thomas suddenly finds himself quite wealthy, quite well off. He moves into nice digs not far off the Strand in London. He begins to imagine what the universe is really like. The possibility of many, many worlds beyond our role inhabited many strange creatures, strange solar systems around distant suns and what they might look like. What, what's going on out there in space? He starts thinking about this puzzling thing in the sky, the Milky Way, the Romans called it the Via Lactea, the road of milk. He wants to know what it is, what makes it work, where are we within the Milky Way? This gorgeous strip of stars above our heads, which we used to be able to see very, very readily until the advent of no light pollution. And it's very difficult to see unless you're in really dark skies. Get yourself to a dark sky site. He wants to know what is the Milky Way? Where are we in the Milky Way? And by a series of simple observations, simply counting stars and estimating their distance, he comes to the conclusion that our sun is not unique. There are many, many stars just like it up there in the sky. And our sun is not a center of the universe, as scripture would have had us believe. Even though we've had Galileo, even though we've had Copernicus, the religious zealots, if you will, are still sticking rigidly to the idea that the earth and the sun are still very much at the center of the universe and everything else is much inferior to us. But Thomas realizes that the sun is not unique. And the sun is not at the center of the universe. But he's a profoundly religious individual. He wants to know what is heaven and what is hell? Is there an afterlife? And he comes to the conclusion by looking at the stars and thinking deeply about the cosmos and the nature of the universe, that heaven is shared 
And it's a rather nice place. It's where we go if we've been good and right and proper during our lives, fine and upstanding. He decides that hell has to be at the center of the sun. Very hot, deeply unpleasant, a little bit like Milton Keynes. Age just 24, already thoroughly well published, thoroughly moving in all of the right circles in society, Wright is proposed for membership of the Royal Society. And you would have imagined, given his compliment, com his, uh, given his abilities, given his, um, the word I'm lost has gone completely, you would think that he'd be an absolute shoe in for membership of the Royal Society. But strangely, Thomas is rejected. And even though I've been looking at this for many, many years, I cannot figure out why Thomas was rejected. All I can imagine is he was rejected on religious grounds because he was a profoundly religious man. And as you know, the Royal Society is a more than a little bit agnostic at times. Undeterred, Thomas develops a career as an architect, as a landscape gardener. He's a profound revival for Lancelot, Capability, Brown, and by all accounts, the two hated each other. Lancelot Capability Brown was very much in favour of digging up the landscape, trashing whatever was there, just to make a pond look nice or a river run around the right side of a hill. Thomas preferred very much to let nature have its course, do the right thing. He also designed a series of grottos, he designed a series of architectural features. Closest to us, perhaps, is Auckland Castle Deer House designed for the Bishop of Durham. It's a feeding place, shelter for the deer. You could use it as an astronomical observatory if you wanted to. Also, the bishop and his guests would put his guests there as well. I wouldn't want to sleep with a load of deer. Eventually, 1750 rolls around and Thomas is a very, very busy man. He's very much in demand amongst the landed gentry for teaching astronomy and teaching mathematics to those with the money. He publishes his book, An Original Theory or New Hypothesis on the Universe where he talks at length about how the Milky Way came about, rough guesstimates of how it came about, the nature of the Milky Way, how he deduced our position in the Milky Way and where the Milky Way might be in space. The book goes out, but unfortunately, doesn't do particularly well. Thomas is noteworthy. He's the first astronomer to accurately describe the shape of the Milky Way. He's used a telescope to glimpse these fuzzy objects out in space. And whilst his telescopes are not quite good enough to resolve shapes, he's starting to get an idea that these little nebulae out in space might be distant galaxies like our own. So there's this inkling of an idea. Unfortunately, Thomas's work is largely forgotten. It's dismissed. He isn't a member of the Royal Society, so his publication have no real traction outside of the coffee rooms. But help is at hand in the, an unusual form. The philosopher, Immanuel Kant, picked up Thomas's ideas and ran with them, brought them to a much wider audience. Those ideas were empirically advanced by none other than William Herschel, who was also a rising star in the field of astronomy. So Thomas Wright's name lasts and hangs in there. And often he's forgotten. He's still celebrated in lots of places, but he's still largely forgotten, which is a shame. So Thomas Wright. So that's the first, per second person we're going to come to in this great Geordie space race. We're going to skip forward a little bit in time to somebody who's perhaps better known, certainly across the water in the Americas. Jeremiah Dixon is very well known indeed. He was born in a little village of Cockfield, County Durham, in the year 1733. He came from a well-off Quaker family. The wealth came from mining, so as a result, from a very early age, Jeremiah is schooled in the science of surveying. He learned all of his trade, all of his mathematics, all of his interests in engineering by simply working in the family mines. He trained properly as a surveyor, but also maintained a very, very strong interest in astronomy and mathematics. And as a direct consequence of that interest in astronomy and mathematics, he was introduced to John Bird the instrument maker, whose rising reputation as a maker of brilliant instruments for use right around the world by Her Majesty's government aboard ships, aboard research vessels, means that Jeremiah, John Bird is listened to. Jeremiah introdu is introduced to John Bird, the instrument maker. John Bird recognises Jeremiah's potential and recommends Jeremiah to the Royal Society as an assistant to one George Mason. There's a hint in the name. George Mason, also an astronomer and surveyor. They have a very special adventure coming up very shortly. 
Their destination is the island of Sumatra out in the East Indies on the other side of the world. It's a long, arduous journey. The idea is that they will go to the far side of the world, this lonely, remote island of Sumatra, and try to observe the transit of the planet Venus, which is scheduled to take place on June the 6th, 1761. Transits of Venus come around in pairs, separated usually about seven or eight years. So they have this opportunity now in 1761 and another one, 1768, 1769, something of that order. Can't remember the exact date. But they've got two chances to do these measurements. Why do they want to do these measurements? Well, they want to determine the distance to the sun. And if they can get the distance to the sun, they can determine the scale of the entire solar system. So it's important that this mission succeeds. Unfortunately, well, let's look at the mathematics involved. If you have two different groups of observers on different sides of the planet, they see different phases of the transit of Venus. And if they measure the rate at which the planet apparently moves across the sun's disk over a fixed period of time, you can do a little bit of very simple trigonometry to work out the position, roughly speaking, of Venus. And if you know the separation, it's very basic, if you know the distance between, say, London and the island of Sumatra, you can very quickly get the distance to the sun. That's in theory, is going to work. Well, this important adventure gets off to a good start. They're fully equipped with instruments, made, of course, by John Bird, also Bishop Auckland. But things go badly wrong. The weather is wrong. Poor old Mason and Dixon are stuck in Plymouth with nothing to do but drink and, um, well, get involved with loose women, let's say. Uh, as a direct consequence of getting drunk far too much, Jeremiah Dixon is drummed out of the local Quaker fraternity in Bishop Auckland. Um, you can still see the records where Jeremiah Dixon, it's a beautiful copper plate writing, Jeremiah Dixon is removed from the Society of Friends. He's later readmitted. There's a happy end to it. Eventually, as soon as they get moving, as soon as they get out into the Bay of Biscay, they are set upon by a French frigate, the Le Grande, because we're at war with the French. Their ship, HMS Seahorse, is very, very badly damaged and limps back to Port Plymouth, where it has to undergo serious repairs. They have to chuck nearly all of their cargo overboard to make, make room for, to improve the maneuverability of the, the warcraft, to get away from the French. They eventually give rise to the French. They lose 11 men. It's a disaster all round. Mason and Dixon are ordered to return back to Plymouth and safety. Eventually, with time running out for the eclipse, they revise their plans and aim for Cape Hope in South Africa, where they set up an observatory and carry out the observations Thankfully, the weather is almost perfect. They miss a little bit of the early part of the transit, but they get the later half and their results are good. As a direct consequence, Mason and Dixon measured the Earth's own distance at roughly 95 million miles. The modern accepted value is 93.5 million miles. So they've worked out the distance to the sun. From there, they've worked out the distance to all of the major planets that are currently visible. Note, that doesn't include Uranus because we have to wait another nearly 30 years for Uranus to be discovered. But you get the idea. They're immediately picked up upon a successful conclusion of their observations at Cape Top by another Geordie. Well, he's from Middlesbrough. Um, Captain James Cook, who takes them to the island of St. Helena for a meetup, a big powwow with all of the, low, the astronomers so they can start to compare results, compare notes, see what values they've got. As a direct consequence of this voyage, James Cook and Jeremiah Dixon remain friends for the rest of their lives, which unfortunately in Jeremiah's case isn't all that long. And certainly James Cook didn't last much longer after that. Looking at the success of the measurements taken at Cape Hope, Jeremiah Dixon is immediately ordered back to the Cape on full pay to carry out a new series of experiments, the so-called gravity experiments. They want to use the gravitational acceleration, swinging pendulums, if you can remember back to secondary school, to work out the gravitational acceleration at Cape Hope. And if they've got the gravitational acceleration at Cape Hope, they compare it with the gravitational acceleration at England and a variety of other locations around the planet. Their ultimate goal 
being to determine the shape of the earth because it had long been suspected that the earth wasn't a perfect sphere and the spinning of the earth turned it from an ob a, a sphere into a mathematical figure called an oblate spheroid how big is that oblate spheroid well simply put jeremiah dixon was able to put measurements on that shape he reckoned that at the equatorial diameter, 12,756 kilometers, and at the polar diameter, the Earth is slightly squashed, 12,714 kilometers. There's not much difference in it, but it does prove that the Earth is slightly distorted. It's slightly pot-bellied in its middle age, and boy, don't we know about that for ourselves. Jeremiah Dixon's fortunes increase dramatically so. He is summoned back to England with a full set of results. And almost as soon as he's landed back in England, he is dispatched on a new mission to the new world, to the Americas. There's a problem. You see, King Charles has granted the Duke of Maryland a certain amount of land in North America. Charles II, his son, comes along and grants another area of land and, between William Penn of Pennsylvania. And there's an argument as to where the border is. And as a result, there's a fight breaks out because different levels of taxation on different air sides of the border. So they want to know exactly where that border is. And Jeremiah Dixon is ordered by King George II and uh, Charles uh, George Mace to go with him to go out to the Americas and to begin surveying to make sure that this land is divided up properly and that the crown gets its full due. So they begin in the gorgeous area of Virginia. They start at a place called Stargazer Stone. There it is. It's a, it's a tourist attraction these days. There's not much left of the original Stargazer Stone because a variety of tourists, Americans being what they are, they like to get down into that little hole and rub the stone. So as a result, the stone has been chipped away and rubbed away. But it's often shown that Dason and Mason and Dixon set off on their lonesome to wander through Virginia, making maps and drawing out the land. But in fact, they had a very large team, there were about 40 people, 40 men. And they also, um, they took it over several years. They didn't just do it all in one long, long summer, they took about seven or eight years. They could only work during few months of the year but they used an astronomical surveying process, work out the position of a star to accurately determine where they were on the surface of the Earth very, very precisely. And as a direct consequence, the Mason-Dixon line is one of the most precise lines on the surface of the planet. It really is. Notionally, why it's remembered today is the Mason-Dixon line separates the free North from the southern slave states. It's very important in the American culture. After this adventure, Jeremiah Dixon returns to England. He continues to work in the Northeast as a surveyor, but he is in poor health. And he dies shortly afterwards, just age, just 44 years of age, at Standrop County, Durham. Um, to his credit, the Mason-Dixon line show there are images all over America recording the path of the Mason-Dixon line. And for a brief time, the north of England, England rewarded Jeremiah with a train with his name on the side of it, that Jeremiah Dixon, son of County Durham, surveyed the Mason-Dixon line. No mention of his astronomical achievements, which were considerable. Um, and I believe that train is no longer in the northeast. I believe it's in Wales at the moment, which is a shame, but there you go. It's about this time that another astronomer enters the picture. He's what we call an occasional visitor to the northeast of England. He's not a resident. He turned up here briefly, stayed a little while, and then moved on to pastures near. We're talking about William Herschel. What's he got to do with the northeast of England? Herschel was born in the electric of, electorate of Hanover, part of the Holy Roman Empire, which is now part of Germany, uh, 1738. He was an astonishing musician. Most of the Herschel family were all gifted musicians. As a consequence, they were conscripted into the Hanover Army Band, which is a shame because Hanover is presently at war with France. Hanover suffers the most appalling loss, tragic loss at the hands of the French army. And to save his sons, Herschel's father, Isaac, tells them, leave, get out of Hanover. Go to England, go to Britain, where it's safe. There's a German monarch on the throne. He's sympathetic to our cause. In effect, William Herschel deserts, runs away to England. The story gets important for us because 
for strange reasons, he moves up to Sunderland in the year 1761. And not long afterwards, he becomes the first violin soloist for Newcastle Orchestra in St. Lucas Cathedral in Newcastle. And he's working under directly under Charles Everson, who is very well regarded today. He's regarded as Newcastle's Mozart, as England's other Mozart. Brilliant composer. But uh, Herschel doesn't stay long, he stays for just one season. He's a star of that season. People come from far and wide to hear Mr. Herschel play. But he moves to Leeds, then Halifax, and eventually to Bath, where he becomes an astronomer. Herschel switches abruptly from music to astronomy. He throws himself into astronomy, into the art of telescope making, into the art of mirror making. He becomes a member of Bath's Learned Society. He invites his sister Caroline to stay with him, stay with him for as long as she wants. Caroline is only too pleased to get out of Hanover and come over to England and work there. She becomes William's observatory assistant. And that worked well because Caroline did phenomenally well for herself in astronomical circles. On the 13th of March, 1781, 13th of March is my birthday, Herschel spots something interesting through his telescope. He is routinely sweeping the sky, looking for unusual objects. He spots something which he thinks is just another nebula, could be a comet, but is in fact the planet Uranus, the first planet to be discovered with a telescope. And thereafter, Mr. Herschel's fortunes are set. Um, he's taken on as a proper paid astronomer royal, not the, but the king's astronomer, got to get that right. The king's astronomer is separate from the astronomer royal, different office entirely. Caroline, his sister, is taken on as assistant and becomes the first female civil servant and the first female professional astronomer that we know about. And Caroline Herschel's career as a, a discoverer of comets really takes off. So that's Herschel's rather spurious, short-lived connection to the northeast of England. He never came back as far as we can tell. Now, at this point in time in the presentation, I would normally go wobbling off and talking about Robert Sterling Newell, but Mr. David Newton, my esteemed colleague, will be talking about Newell tomorrow. Stick around, it's a fascinating talk. Um, so I'm not able to talk about Newell. I had to find somebody else from the northeast of England to talk about. So I picked on George Biddle Airy who was one of the longest, longest serving astronomer royals in England. Phenomenal achievement. He was born in Anak, 1801, although he moved away from the region fairly sharpish. I think he was only two or three when he moved away. His house is still there. There's a blue plaque attached to the wall to commemorate it. Uh, I haven't visited it yet. I will one day. But Aries promise is an academic. Aries promise is a as a scholar is already starting to shine through. He enters Trinity College in Cambridge as a sizar. The sizar means that he doesn't have the working capital to pay his fees up front. He has to work as a servant to his elders and betters to make up his student fees. His promise starts to throw through 1822. He is elected, he wins, he graduates as the senior wrangler meaning he's the top mathematics graduate of about 100 students. He does phenomenally well. He's elected a fellow of Trinity College. He's not even, he's 21, 23, something like that. At the age of 26 years old, he's only 25. He's appointed Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Trinity College, Cambridge. And if you look at the company he's keeping, look at the other Lucasian Professors of Mathematics, Isaac Newton, Charles Babbage, Paul Dirac, Stephen Hawking. So Airy is moving in phenomenals. His, his pedigree is amazing. He becomes a fellow of the Royal Society, aged just 35, almost unheard of. Airy is soon appointed to be the director of this new Greenwich Observatory, which is in a terrible state. It's utterly disorganized. The results they produce are not world class. Airy sets about revolutionizing, changing everything about the observatory. He's brilliant at organizing, a brilliant at sorting out data and making sure that empirical astronomical data is recorded properly. It's called the airy tradition, this desire for precision, eliminating errors as you go, reducing errors in your measurement to make sure that what you produce is good work. 
He starts to revolutionize the equipment that they've got. He gets a hold of a really good altazimuth scope for measuring accurate observations of the moon because accurate observations of the moon help to determine where you are on land because we know the position of the moon particularly well. And if you can measure occultations of stars by the moon, you have a very good idea of where you are on the surface of the earth. He was responsible for commissioning the great equatorial reflector, sorry, refracting telescope at the Greenwich Observatory. It was made by Sir Howard Grubb of Dublin. Remember that name, a phenomenally good telescope. I'm not sure if this is Airy using the telescope or another observer, I can't tell from this picture. But he sets about revising and updating all of the observatory's transit instruments to make sure that they are world-class and deserving of a world-class observatory. He's best remembered amongst astronomers via this queer phenomena called the airy disk. The mathematics of it are quite torturous, but they relate to what you theoretically should see when you look through a telescope compared with what you do see. Telescopes suffer from problems, no matter their size, no matter their quality, they suffer from a phenomena called diffraction. And these diffraction rings, which are caused by the lens supports or the mirror supports severely limit the ability of the objective to resolve faint and uh, close together objects. It resolves, it relates to resolving fine detail and airy worked out the mathematics in some considerable precision. So the bigger telescope stars, but the bigger the telescope is, the better able it is to resolve fine detail. And airy explained all of that mathematically. Aries' other work is of critical importance to astronomers and to geolo geologists as well. He was responsible for working out the mean density of the Earth. Obviously, the density of the Earth varies from location to location to location. But Airy wanted to know roughly what the density was, the mean density. He came back up north to start working at Harton Colliery, which is one of the deepest mines in England, one of the deepest and safest mines. It's now the site of a hospital, but he begins a series of pendulum experiments. Two pendulums, one at the top of the mine and the other at the bottom of the mine, roughly 300, 400 metres apart. You set the pendulums going and you measure the difference in the period of oscillations between them. And it's dependent upon the gravity at the surface and the gravity within the Earth. You've got a slightly different reading. And Airy, at the conclusion of these results, the experiment went on for some considerable time at the conclusion, came back north to talk about the results in front of an absolutely packed auditorium in South Shields of people eager to know how the experiment had gone. It's recorded in some considerable detail on one of the local history sites. I can't remember if I included the link, um, but what Airy concluded was that the gravity at the bottom of the mine was higher than that at the top by a tiny fraction, one twenty thousandth of the amount, one nineteen thousand two hundred eighty-sixth of that amount. So the difference is incredibly small, but Airy was able to measure it with some considerable degree of confidence. Airy also went to work on the so-called reference ellipsoid. We still use it today when we to use ordnance survey maps. Your sat nav is utterly dependent on Airy's work on the so-called reference geoid, the position and accurate positioning of objects on the surface of the planet, all relates to Airy's need for precision and the ability to define accurately where something is. Airy also did some work on the mass of Jupiter, careful observations, timings of the moons of Jupiter to give some idea as to how massive Jupiter was because we only have a rough idea of how it was. An accurate measure might be give us some ideas about what else is going on in the solar system. Aries also best remembered for establishing the so-called prime meridian of the Earth. Now we've all done it. Anybody who's ever been to Greenwich, the, the Greenwich Observatory, not just outside of London. Well, let's skip back a little. Ptolemy's idea of zero degrees longitude, the longitude problem, ran slightly east of Africa. This is going back to the time of Ptolemy, which is 200 AD. Mercator, who produced one of the first projection maps, or the first projection map, had the meridian, zero degrees latitude, running what we now regard as 25 degrees west of Santa Maria Island in the middle of the Atlantic, which is as much use as a chocolate fire guard. 
because trying to establish exactly where you are at sea is nigh on impossible. 1884, the French, they ought to know better by now, decided that the Meridian had to go through Paris because it was the metropolis, it was the centre of the civilised world. Airy, nope, not happening. The Meridian, the reference for zero degrees longitude, went through London, namely Greenwich. And this was based purely on the quality of the observations at the Greenwich Observatory. Airy found fault with the measurements of the parish observatory and was able to demonstrate those faults and showed clearly to the satisfaction of everybody else that the observations and measurements taken at Greenwich of stars, the culmination of stars, was way better than those that could manage at Paris observatories. And consequently, that's why we have zero degrees longitude goes through Greenwich Park in London. And those of us who Venice visited Greenwich Park, you've all done it. We've I've done it. We put one foot on east and the other foot on west, and you know it's it's fun. It's what you do. It's what we astronomers called humor. Aries work, the search for Neptune. His career takes a bit of a downturn at this point. He shoots himself in the foot. He's very much a theoretician. He's very, very good at reducing measurements to useful data. He's not a particularly brilliant observer. Airy starts corresponding with a French astronomer, Urban Le Verrier, about this idea of a planet beyond Uranus. Le Verrier has predicted irregularities in the motion of Uranus. Other astronomers have witnessed those irregularities in the orbit of Uranus. And the implication is that there is another planet further out, somewhere out there, some distance out there. So the search is on to find it. Airy delegates the job to astronomer, Cambridge astronomer John Couch Adams, and commissions another astronomer, James Chalice, to undertake a systematic search in the hope of securing the discovery of this planet, this unknown body, for Britain. It's very, very important that the British beat the French to finding this planet. Unfortunately, it's discovered by a German, Gottfried, Johann Gottfried van Gaal. He discovers it. The story goes that John Couch Adams was supposed to have discovered it. Um, I'll go into this another time. There's another time. But it was discovered by a German. And Airy was blamed. Airy was savaged by the press, by the newspapers. They took him to bits. They said he was incompetent. They said he wasn't worthy of the position. John Couch Adams didn't help matters by passing the blame around. Airy didn't help matters one iota by insisting that planet hunting was not a job for the Astronomer Royal. It was for people further down the pay grid. And his reputation was damaged irreparably. He was ridiculed, lampooned, cartoon in the papers. He was made a figure of fun. Didn't help him at all. Worse still for Airy, and this forever casts a shadow on his reputation as a scientist, is that he looked at Charles Babbage's analytical engine, this early forebear, this mechanical forebear of the computer, this machine that could calculate nautical tables, astronomical tables, considerably faster than a team of tra skilled, trained computers, computers in those days referred to people who did calculations. Airy dismissed it, said that it was, I think it likely that he, naming Babbage, lives in a sort of dream as to its utility. Babbage went berserk. Babbage wrote a series of incredibly unpleasant messages, letters that were published in newspapers to Airy, harmed Airy's reputation even more, seriously damaged Babbage's reputation, didn't matter. Babbage's analytical engines were consigned to the dustbin and they were never properly finished and Britain never got the leap in computational science that it should really have deserved, thanks largely to Airy. Airy's legacy, he's remembered with a crater on Mars, I'm sure there's a crater on the moon as well. Um, he's perhaps forgotten and overlooked these days, these last episodes in his career sort of detract from his capabilities and as an astronomer and his achievements as astronomer royal. A shame, really, because he did very well. Of the same epoch, we have another Herschel on the scene. Herschel that was born outside of the United Kingdom, but came to Newcastle, came to the northeast of England to do his best work, the work he's best remembered for. He was born 1835, 
Cape Town, South Africa, studied in England, studied, I believe, at Cambridge, didn't, didn't acquit himself brilliantly well at Cambridge, but he did well enough. He went to work for uh, the Department of Mines and the United Kingdom government, picked up an interest in geology, picked up an interest in particular in meteorites. And before too long, returned to academia as the first professor of physics and experimental philosophy at the University of Durham, which was at that time situated in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, separate and distinct from Newcastle University as it is today. Herschel arrived, the laboratories were in a very, very poor state. They'd been allowed to run down. The equipment was not modern, up to date, and much of it was broken or non-existent. Herschel built much of the apparatus in this newly installed laboratory, and it created a worldwide reputation for astronomical excellence, particularly in the field of meteor astronomy. When the college was eventually moved to new buildings, new purpose-built buildings, the Herschel Physical Laboratory, it's now the Herschel Building, it's named after Alexander. It's commonly assumed that the Herschel Building is named after William Herschel. It's not. It's named after his grandson, Alexander. Alexander did some fantastic work on explaining the origin of meteor, meteor showers, why we see lots and lots of meteors at some times during the year and not at others. He figured that there was a stream of debris in space, perhaps left behind by a comet, as a comet passed by, and the Earth passed through that stream of debris. And these meteors that we see coming through the atmosphere are the debris of comets, left over perhaps from the formation of the solar system. And if you've got an idea where this stuff comes from, where meteorites come from, you can make some use of it. Herschel follows in the footstep of a couple of others, uh, in measuring the height, the speed of meteors as they enter the Earth's atmosphere to some commendable good work. The first example of crowdsourcing where multiple astronomers witnessed the same uh, meteor, but from different locations. And by carefully accurately measuring the position of that meteorite in the sky, you can work out how high it is when it broke up and so on. He's also spent some time looking at the sky, studying meteor radiance, where meteors suddenly seem to appear in the sky. He noticed a couple of meteor showers, one of which was in the constellation near the constellation Lyra. It became a new meteor stream that we see nearly every, every year. Some years it's good, some years it's bad. The Lyric meteor stream discovered by Herschel. One of his greatest findings, one of his accidental findings, is the so-called Middlesbrough meteorite of 1881. A bunch of railway workmen working in a siding as the newly installed railway is being put together suddenly hear a rushing and a roaring sound followed by a thud. The workmen investigate a smoking hole in the siding, wonder what it is. Rumour spreads that it's some strange object that's falling from the sky. Somehow word is, word is sent to Herschel, maybe by a telegram. Herschel comes rushing back down to Middlesbrough by horse and cart, um, arrives on scene whilst the meteorite is still lukewarm. He can't guarantee that the workmen themselves haven't stuck their hands down the hole to find out, but Herschel extracts this well-known meteor, this lovely piece meteor, classified the Middlesbrough meteorite as a chondrite, it's approximately 4.5 billion years old, roughly the same age as the Earth, which is a startling find. It's significant in working out the age of the Earth. And since we're talking about rocks, since we're talking about meteorites, let's hear it for the geologists from this part of the world as well. Arthur Holmes, born in Hebben near Newcastle, it's in Gateshead, actually, 1890, rose to become the head of the geology department at Durham University. There's a whole building, whole lecture theatre, the Holmes Lecture Theatre, named after him. He did some astonishing work on radiometric dating of minerals, radiometric dating of um, objects that are pulled out of the earth, of meteorites that have fallen from the sky. Looked at developing theories of mechanical and thermal implications of what we call mantle convection. And we see other things like this in other planets around the solar system. And it led, Holmes's work led directly to the formation of the plate tectonic theory. So Holmes is one of the better known ones. Um, Sir Harold Jeffries, slightly less than known, born in Fatfield, Washington, 1891, developed a theory that Earth's planetary core is not solid, but is in fact liquid. It's molten. It moves around. 
and the earth, the solid rock beneath our feet, floats atop this magma ocean, this fluid. Um, and this motion accounts for a lot, it, it responsible for the Earth's magnetic field. We'll come into that later on. His theories are kind of knocked a little bit on the head because Sir Harold is an opponent of the theory of continental drift, despite there's an awful lot of evidence that continental drift tectonic plates is becoming more or less solid and well known in physics and established as the good theory. He's a, a vigorous opponent of it, never really accepts it. So he's kind of pushed to one side and forgotten. Moving on, roughly the same sort of epoch, Thomas Backhouse, a phenomenally well-known astronomer in uh, Sunderland. I'm not sure if he was from Sunderland, I think he was born in Darlington, but he certainly spent a major part of his life in Sunderland, part of the Backhouse Bank, I believe there's Backhouse Park, which is not far away from his observatory. A phenomenal observer, very practical astronomer. We do know that he traveled extensively around the world to view eclipses, we know that he discovered three meteor showers. Um, probably the first properly document, noctilucent or night shining clouds, these gorgeous clouds that inhabit the summer skies. We only see them the last week in May to the first week in July. Ice clouds, ice crystals high up at the edge of space in the mesosphere. Um, they were assumed something to do with the eruption of Krakatoa, but they happen on and off. Thomas Backhouse is the first person to accurately document them that we know of. Backhouse produced numerous star catalogues. Backhouse's publications, I've got three, four of them here. They're incredibly detailed. These are thanks to my friend Dave Newton to loaning them to me. Dave, do you want them back sometime? I've had them a number of years now. They're incredibly detailed, incredibly accurate. Fastidious work. It shows the length of the trouble that this guy went to. He's one of the few observers to accurately measure look at, observe the Gegenschein, interplanetary dust clouds that are very, very difficult to see. Those are dust clouds within the plane of our solar system and the anti-solar the anti -solar point, the exact opposite of where the sun is in the sky. And that's not the sun rising, that's lights from a distant town. It's a very long time exposure to get that image. But the sunlight reflecting off this interplanetary dust back at us, it's difficult to see. You need incredibly dark skies and incredibly good eyesight to see it. Thomas managed it with ease. He was particularly interested in the stars around Orion, looking at these unusual structures in advance of the discovery of the Barnett's Loop. He was particularly interested in so-called straight lines of stars, how stars could often be seen as a series of straight lines stretching across the sky. And Backhouse wondered what sort of phenomena might have given rise to these. These are not the best examples. These are the ones I could find at the time. But Backhouse studied these with just a pair of binoculars, made very accurate maps of the sky, wondering where these stars came from, this structure, underlying structure. He wanted to know if there was a cause. He unfortunately died again March 13th. That date keeps coming around. He was so well known and so well respected. His obituary ran to two pages in the monthly notice of the Royal Astronomical Society. So well thought of. And his work these days is still very highly regarded in astronomical circles. Rumour has it that he died only hours after completing his final observation. That's dedication for you. That really is. Skipping forward a little bit because I realise I'm running out of time. We've got the Vicar of Tau Law, the Reverend Thomas Henry Espinel Compton Espin. It's a hell of a mouthful to get your mouth around. Likewise, I have been told that I cannot refer to him as the Vicar of Tau Law. I must refer to him as the perpetual curate of Tau Law because vicar is the wrong term. But Espin is special, very special, because it runs at odds with the rhetoric of the day that astronomy and religion, theological work, clerical work, us entirely separate, diverse subjects. You can't work with astronomy and Espen proved that you could. He had a significant number of scientific interests, interests apart from the obvious geology and astronomy. He was also mad into botany and tropical fish. He studied fossils and he had a few fairly interesting exchanges with Charles Darwin, questioning the validity of the theory of evolution, the origin of species. He was also a hell of a shot. He taught the local scouts of the Church Lads Brigade how to fire rifles in a shooting range set up in the basement of the um, church house, which is perhaps not good. 
He built his own x-ray machine. Imagine trying to get that through health and safety. But it's rumoured, reputed, recorded. The Reverend Espin did considerable service to the local medical practitioners, x-raying people who'd broken limbs, looking for signs of broken bones. Espin himself became hooked on astronomy in 1874. I've got 1974 there. That should be 1874, following an apparition of Comet Kajir. Completely hooked on astronomy. His studies were so good that he was elected a fellow of the Iran Astronomical Society, age just 19. That's phenomenal. Came up north. He had two observatories, one in Walsingham, which is not far from Town Law. His major observatory, as far as we could tell, was at Town Law. It's a 24-inch Calver reflector. But we do know that he had an 18-inch width reflector at Walsingham, which was kind of a second residence, kind of second sort of um, house, parochial house, if you will. He was also phenomenally well published by that time as well. Town Law, he was recruited to become the perpetual curate of Town Law, which was kind of like a wild west town in the northeast of England. There were more public houses per head of the populace than any other town in England. So he had his work cut out for him. His skill as an observer, he would observe all night long, get two nights, two hours sleep, and then immediately get dressed and resume his business as a member of the clergy. Perhaps, you know, he'd observe all Saturday night, get out of bed, go to bed at two, six o'clock on a Sunday morning, and then 10 o'clock, get up, deliver a word perfect sermon to the congregation, and then go back and perhaps collapse in bed for another couple of hours kip. He used to work in temperatures that were just impossible. Rumour has it that he took a cat with him into the observatory and stuffed the cat down his jerkin in an attempt to stay warm, wrapping newspapers round his legs in an attempt to ward off the cold. Very dedicated observer. He began an extensive cataloguing procedure, many nebulas, many variable stars, more than 2,500 double stars. He had a special interest in red dwarves, any kind of red dwarf with a trace of metallic oxide in their spectrum. I'm not sure why, just one of those special interests he had. International recognition followed for the quality and reliability of his work. He became a, um, a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, member of the Astronomical Society of Mexico. It's strange, this one, a very, very close, the Astronomical and Astrophysical Society of America. Brilliant. He also became the first president of Newcastle Astronomical Society. Marvellous. Here he is. Here's a photograph taken of him on the steps of King's Hall at Newcastle University in about 1904. And the picture I've got came without any kind of information. So I deduced a bit of guesswork that the guy on the left there is Espin. By now, getting on in years of it, over on the right, we've got Sir Charles Parsons with his eyes shut, but I was puzzled who this guy was in the middle. Turns out that it's Frank Watson Dyson, then the Astronomer Royal. So a little bit of detective work paid off. This shows the circles in which Espen was moving. Espen hits pay dirt, 1910, when he discovers a, a nova, not a supernova, a nova, nova Lacerta, and it's his accurate measurements of this star and its brightness as the brightness fades away. And he's a rewarded 1913 award of the Royal Astronomical Society's prestigious, prestigious Jackson Gwilt Medal. So his star is really right. He's really cooking on gases, this guy. He continues observing for the rest of his life, even into old age, when he perhaps should have given up. He stares a picture there with his cat. This is the cat that he used to stuff down his jerkin, apparently. Um, cat didn't seem to mind too much either. He's remembered a creator Espin on the far side of the moon. His work is still regarded as very, very valuable. His telescope, after his death, fell into disrepair. It was recovered from a hen house up at Town Law in about 1965 and fully refurbished, presented to Newcastle University in about 1973, where it was used by their undergraduate program, occasionally graduate program. I used it when I was a graduate, undergraduate at Newcastle University. Although with the sale of Close House um, by the university, it was moved into storage in 2010 and its present location is unknown. And Roy's gonna tell me it's time to uh, start shutting up.
I'm not. Is that the one? Is I'm not. Is is that the telescope that's sitting up um, derelict right now in in the observatory at Close House? I understand that the uh, telescope mechanics are, um, yeah. but the um, optics are not. The optics are not. They're up, uh, apparently in the basement of Mertz Court, being protected. Yes, that's what I've heard as well. Because um, there was a NASA scientist who came for a walk in in Northumberland had happened to tweet about it because as she was walking through various fields and so on she happened to walk through the close house um uh, grounds and happened to see these observatories and the doors have been vandalized people have tried to get in there so she stuck a camera in put the flash on took some pictures and it's still sitting there so me and me and Dave Newton who's doing the talk tomorrow we we tried to get in touch with Graham Wiley of Sage um <laughs> And I contacted him through the grounds person. Apparently, uh, I, it's, I'm not sure whether Graham does or doesn't speak to lowly astronomers like myself. But uh, when I suggested that Dave and I could refurbish, rebuild the scope, do it as for free as a project and maybe help them get into astrotourism again for free, the answer was a flat no. Didn't even want to talk about it. They don't care. They just don't care. There's yeah. this beautiful monument of astronomical history sitting in an observatory in Close House, and Graham Wiley is just letting it rot. And I think yes. that's a tragedy. Right. Hang with us. It, it gets it gets worse. Well, I <laughs> I used to work for Sage, and I will not comment any further because I'm too much of a gentleman. And besides, he would ban me for using the profanities. <clears throat> I will continue. The present location of the optics is unknown, but believed to be in Mertz Court. Skip forward a little bit to the same epoch. Grub Parsons Limited. Grub Parsons. The United Kingdom's, well, first and foremost, best telescope make ever. End of discussion. They're responsible for some of the biggest and best telescopes in the world. That's a personal point of view because I'm kind of biased. Where did they come from? The Grubb family had a long reputation. Remember we talked about the Greenwich Refractor built by Thomas Grubb? Well, the Grubb family had developed a reputation for very, very good astronomical telescopes, some really fantastic work. But towards the end of the existence of the Grubb company, Howard Grubb had inherited the company from his father. He was perhaps not in the best of health, and they took on a commission, one commission too far. We think in about 1910, they took on a commission from the Russian Moscow Academy of Sciences to build the biggest refracting telescope in the world, the Russian 41-inch refractor. And this was a monumental piece of work. The glass alone, the glass lens blanks, the crown and flint blanks, took years to fabricate and almost bankrupted the Grubb company. Thomas Grubb, his health was failing by then. And what happened was the Russian Revolution. And when they were on a point of producing this gorgeous telescope, the Russian Academy of Sciences mailed them back and said, I'm sorry, we've just had a revolution. We have no need for one of these filthy bourgeois telescopes. Can you just keep it? You can find somebody else to use it. And indeed, the two lens blanks, um, I discovered them in a tour of the, Victor the Discovery Museum in Newcastle about uh, seven or eight years ago, we found these two lens blanks just sitting on pallets. They'd been badly damaged, but there they were. They're the two lens blanks for this huge telescope. The Grubb Company, the Grubb Telescope Company, was in some considerable trouble. But to his credit, Sir Charles Parsons at the top here, realised that there was a future in the construction, the fabrication of large scale astronomical telescopes. And he set about founding the Grubb Parsons Telescope Company, which was based in uh, Heaton, a little place called Walkergate. And it survived producing the most amazing telescopes for, well, well over 60, 70 years. The Heaton works were just the schoolboy's dream. I remember going there on a, a trip out with Newcastle Astronomical Society to see the William Herschel telescope shortly before it was dismantled and sent out to Las Palmas. It's a truly astonishing telescope. And they did make some of the best telescopes in the world. Arguably one of the best is the so-called Anglo-Australian telescope, which is currently installed in Siding Springs in Australia, it's a hint of the name there. It was opened 1973 by the then Astronomer Royal, Sir Fred Hoyle, it's a handy bit of rhyming there, and a certain royal prince, Prince Charles, went out to see the opening of this telescope. And this telescope 
did the most phenomenal work and it's still doing the most phenomenal work um, 50 years after it was uh, opened, produced Walkergate by this little company, Grub Parsons Telescopes, and took some of the most amazing photographs. He has a wonderful picture of the Horsehead Nebula uh, taken by astrophotographer David Mallins. David Mallins became world famous for the quality, the breathtaking quality of these images. As I say, the last telescope that was built there was the William Herschel Telescope for Las Palmas, and that would be about 1984, where I saw it shortly before it was dismantled, as I say, of course. Grub Parsons, with the advent of the Margaret Thatcher government, saw no need whatsoever for large format astronomical telescopes and killed pretty much every order that was on their books. And Grub Parsons was unable to survive, despite valiant efforts, unable to survive in that kind of economic climate, and they closed. And this was terrible news, particularly for me, because I just graduated in 1884 and I really could have done with a job working, building big telescopes. Wouldn't that have been fun? But suddenly there was no work to be had, no telescopes to be made, which is a massive shame. And it was bad news. And we thought, damn it, what's going to happen to all of the instrument archive? What's going to happen to all of the document archive? And we thought it had been destroyed, simply put on a bonfire and burned. But a couple of years ago, a friend of mine, an astronomer called Dave Kidd, another history buff like myself who likes digging around in archives. Dave was doing some inventory work at the Discovery Museum in Newcastle and he came across the Grub Parsons archives. Now, I don't think the museum staff really knew what they had. And even today, much of it is still uncatalogued despite Dave's better efforts. But Dave Comer came across some remarkable designs. Grub Parsons had been asked to quote for a tessellated mirror telescope. That is a multi-mirror telescope in 1965. That's a long time ago and certainly a long time before we got multi-mirror telescopes working. Grubbs honestly believed they could get it working, but it wasn't the only surprise. We found many more surprises for development works, for research programs that were then underway the granddaddy that we then found, the one that left Dave and I absolutely gobsmacked, was the Large Astronomical Satellite Telescope. And this drawing is dated 1966. Grub Parsons were attempting to build a space telescope. They did the design work. They did an awful lot of the test and experimental work that would prove that the CUDA system that they intended to fly would work and would be reliable out in space. The instrument banks were designed and thought out, although the fabrication of this instrument took place elsewhere. It actually did fly. This configuration designed but not built on Tyneside, did fly. It was part of the International Ultraviolet Explorer, and the mission was launched in 1978 and ran successfully until 1996, when the project ran out of money. The telescope is still up there. It still could be made to work if they can get enough fuel to switch the thing back on. It would work. So that's a little piece of astronomical excellence, designed in the Northeast, still out there in space. At the same time, we got the Blue Street Project, 1957. Britain didn't want to be utterly dependent upon the United States to defend itself from nuclear weapons launched by the Soviet Union. They decided they needed their independent nuclear deterrent. As a means of deploying that deterrent, they developed the Blue Street missiles, and that project began in 1957. The launch site was chosen a spade Adam forest over in Cumbria. It's probably not all that far away from your dark sky sites. In fact, you can, you can hear, still hear British gas testing pipelines to destruction out at spade Adam forest. There were rocket launch silos, our very own Tracy Island in the Northeast of England. We could have launched rockets from this part of the world. As it was, we ran an awful lot of the tests there. The silos used for launching those rockets are still there. The army still used them for training on. The rockets themselves were tested out in, uh, I believe, Woomera out in Australia. This is not, as one of my previous delegates pointed out, the Solway of Earth. This is, in fact, looking at the desert scrubland. This is not Cumbria. You don't get a desert like that in Cumbria. You get that in Australia. But here's one of the Blue Street rocket missiles, the, the, the rocket engines under test out in Australia. But this sort of testing would have gone on in the northeast of England. Move on to modern times. Not when we're wrong, I've got long to go. 
up to date. Newcastle University rapidly becoming into the system. David, I'm not worried. Everybody has just said, carry on. This is brilliant. And they love it. The presentation is wonderful. Your knowledge is fantastic. Carry on. Keep bruttering my ego. I don't mind. I can <laughs> be here till 11 o'clock at night. OK, right. I suspect you need a toilet break. I'm OK at the minute. I've got a little milk bottle under the desk. I can keep going as long as you can. Okay. That's a joke. That's a joke. I haven't. OK, I will take a drink of coffee. Hang on. Into the 1950s and 60s, the reputation of Newcastle University as a centre for astronomical excellence had grown and grown and grown. The Herschel Building in particular, under the leadership of, of Professor Keith Runcorn, who is a professor of, he's a head of physics and a geologist of some considerable renown. Um, he was an astonishing geologist, astonishing theoretician, and he did absolutely everything he could to push Newcastle University and their physics department to the upper echelons, to rival the big American, the big Soviet universities, big Japanese universities. And he was incredibly successful, especially, this comes sharply into focus, with the Apollo moon missions, starting in 1969 with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin setting foot on the surface of the moon. The rock samples that Aldrin and Armstrong brought back with them, samples were shipped over to Newcastle University to begin testing on what became known as the paleomagnetic, the, the moon's paleomagnetic um, field. Did the early moon have a magnetic field? And is it similar to the Earth's? And these tests were carried out, believe it or not. The Newcastle University went absolutely berserk. Here is a clip from the Student Union magazine at the time. Run corn triumph with moon rock. Don't be a hippie, says somebody. <laughs> You've got to wonder who wrote that headline. Um, I think it's one of the local government ministers wrote it. Don't be a hippie, right? Be a physicist instead. But you can see how knowledgeable, you know, they really captured the imagination. And Runcorn's team did a fantastic job of analysing that, those moon rock samples. Where were those moon rock samples done? Well, hang on a second. Crowds learned about these moon rock samples. The university, to their credit, put these moon rock samples on display in the Herschel building. And the crowds queued around the building, patiently waiting for a glimpse of moon rock. Look at the fashions, look at the styles. I don't remember queuing up. I would only be in about seven or so. I think we might have done, I don't really remember. I just remember an enormous queue around the block. They had security guards on manning this little, tiny little glass petri dish full of moon rock samples. And you weren't allowed anywhere near it in case, you know, somebody nicked it. We'll talk about that later at this time. Where were those tests done? close house near Wylam because the university had a big observatory out there. This is what Roy is talking about. It's currently owned by Mr. Graham Wiley, the head of SAGE. It's a golf course. The university sold it off. Up that hill on the right of the, uh, the great big building there, that's where the observatories are. The observatories that Roy just mentioned, they're the ones that are being allowed to go to derelict. The investigations themselves were carried out in the middle of the lawn at Close House. The analysis took place in a small purpose-built wooden shed. So you can imagine that great big gorgeous golf cricket pitch there with a little tacky last of the summer wine shed slap bang in the middle of it. No ferrous materials were allowed nearby. The geophys team scanned that area looking for anything vaguely magnetic that it would interfere with their um, measurements. The building itself, this little wooden cabin held together by copper nails, which quickly deteriorated. The equipment inside that shed was so sensitive that it could detect trains running up and down the nearby Newcastle Wylam line um, a mile away. It was that sensitive. And to their credit, they did some amazing work. They were able to demonstrate, after a bit of this, is, I'm jumping a couple, several steps, the origin of the moon, the most likely hypothesis. There were a number of hypotheses kicking around at the time, but the most likely origin of the moon was that a Mars-sized body, which we've dubbed Thea, collided with the very early proto-Earth. The two bodies coalesced and thoroughly mixed, but because of conservation of angular momentum and momentum in general, a cloud of debris was thrown into orbit. It formed a ring around the Earth, and that is where the moon came from. The moon coalesced from the debris from this collision. And we know that because the Earth's magnetic field and the moon's magnetic field 
are almost completely identical. It also boils down to the intermixing of various isotopes as well. Oxygen isotopes, for instance, that are almost exactly identical on Earth and in the moon. So we now have, because of the work that's done it down the road at New up the road at Newcastle University, an idea for the age of the Earth, the age of the moon, and we know the origin of the moon as well. That proves the viability, the work done. What about the future? Sad to say, Newcastle University, for reasons that are beyond me, closed their physics department in about 2005. They claimed that there weren't enough graduates coming through and a number of the key academic staff had simply retired because by then they were of retirement age and moving on. Of the future, to their considerable credit, Durham University have gone forward and are still moving forward with leaps and bounds. Hardly a week goes by without Durham University making some kind of press announcement. This is a relatively old one from 2013. I should have done my homework and actually found a more recent one. But they've got the most phenomenal astrophysics section, cosmological computing section. They still maintain the annual Grub Parsons lecture. Then they've got the Durham University, the Center for Computational Cosmology. This is just a, a, a data processing technician's just wet dream. It really is phenomenal, the computing taking place in that facility for use to build up enormous maps of how the early universe came about, looking at the, the cosmic background radiation and trying to extrapolate from there how these structures in the universe came about and why we are where we are. Recently, 2015, 2017, I think, they opened the Ogden Centre for Fundamental Physics. It's the weirdest looking building you've ever seen. All different weird angles. It must have been an absolute nightmare to fit carpets in that place and to rearrange furniture. But, you know, it's a tremendous looking building when they opened it. They're great big, you know, wonderful display, but they had images of Thomas Wright and some of Thomas Wright's discoveries displayed on the outside of the building. Great big. Um, projection screens going up there. Just absolutely tremendous atmosphere because it's doing some tremendous work. Newcastle University, to their credit, astronomy and physics are back on the curriculum. They're now running a proper astronomy with astrophysics and physics course. Excellent. And that's nearly it. That's nearly it. So when you try and so and I've missed, I've skipped bits out. I've had to miss some stuff out. But when you think of the amazing history of just one tiny little part of the world. You know, look at us, we're, we're right up in the northeast of England. It's freezing cold and it's nearly always raining and we've had a foot of snow in the last two weeks. <laughs> it's just phenomenal that we managed to achieve so much. But if we've achieved that, it brings us to another question. What's in your backyard? Go have a look. Go and celebrate some of the work that these astronomers that have done in your own backyard. Go and see what they've done and write them down because they deserve to be remembered. Their contribution, their sacrifices need to be celebrated before we're all turned to dust. So that's it. That's the Great Geordie Space Race. And I surprised an hour and a quarter. I surprised myself. I, did, I thought I knew it would be a long one. But yeah. I'm happy to take no, some good. questions. It's good, it's good, it's good. Um, so um, brilliant, brilliant talk, learned very much. Great talk. Uh, my mum has said she enjoys your sense of humour and stories. Um, this guy is brilliant, uh, from Rachel, um, seconded, all of those things. Men and women in sheds in the north of England discussing Excellent. astronomy things. <laughs> um, there aren't any questions, actually. Um, oh, right. Someone has said, should we, should we form a team and go and liberate the telescope from Close House? To which I said, uh, you know, whilst oh. I think the intentions would be great, uh, you know, I couldn't possibly encourage criminal activity. But the thing is, Graham Wiley's not going to own Close House forever. Um, no. So, you know, and actually, you never know. Give it a couple of years. He might kind of look up the hill and look at what's going on in astronomy in, the, in England. And he might think, well, maybe we should do something about that. Who knows? He's resisted so far. Well, he's a very busy man. Maybe it's not resistance. Maybe it's just... I think the trouble is when, when you're someone like Graham Wiley and you've got all this money and all this fame and all and so on, I suspect you end up being really cautious and suspicious of people who uh -huh. approach you and want things from you. Yes. Um, so I, I, I'd imagine there's some of that as well. Um, but anyway, you know, let's just 
let's keep let's keep an eye on that and see where that telescope goes. So we are looking for questions um, from the YouTube chat. If anybody has any specific questions, um, Rachel was asking about something in one of your pictures. Was that um, zodiacal light? You had something on your screen saying it can shine. On the opposite. And, is it zodiacal light? Uh, da, 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 can't remember. Earth um, shine. No. No. Earth, no, no, it's not no, Earth. It's Definitely not. not Earth shine. No, it's not. No, oh. but Rachel, if you can, I mean, are there any yeah. proper astronomers around? But is zodiacal light the same as? Hang on, I'm, no, I'm, it's I'm, not. no, I, I can oh. answer that question. I'm a proper it's astronomer. Not. I can answer you? that question. Yeah, yeah, proper. It's my job and everything, David. It's, it's... <laughs> Right. Okay. So if it was, I mean, I'm sure, do you know what? I'm sure Rach knows that what Earth shine is. Um, so Rachel, could I perhaps if you, uh, later on, if you skip back through the video and find that slide and maybe fire a question at me in Twitter um, at some point there tomorrow, whenever you get a minute, uh, I'll fire that across to David so we can at least satisfy our curiosity. Because obviously, I mean, zodiacal light is when sunlight shines off dust that's in in the solar system that's in the disk of the planetary plane isn't it it's that's what Gag gagenshine is i'm just looking it up i've actually been sent a message now from ian taylor i'm not sure if ian is actually on youtube at the moment oh but ian i've got your uh, i've got your message i'm just looking it up on espin's observatory um maybe i shouldn't do that right now because my phone is ah yes it, it actually relates to the observatory domes at close house and um, thanks, Ian, if you're listening. Yes. Uh, um, well, if he is, he's not in the chat, but Ian has been in some of the chats. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, what, what might be happening, this is what's happening, is we have only 40 actual live viewers, but since the stream started, up to 90 people have been watching it. So Ian might be watching it a little bit behind us. Okay, um, right. So that happens sometimes. It does, it does. No, well, that's cool. Uh, someone else said, great, thanks for talk. Really learned a lot. And actually, that same person asked what your qualifications were. And I said, well, if one of your lecturers was Paul Davies, and he was your tutor, he was one of my lecturers. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. Then you must have got a physics degree. I uh, have indeed. Yes, I've got two degrees. I've got a physics degree, and I've got a degree in physical electronics as well. So there you go. So there you go. Um, <laughs> Gixt, that's your, your name. Um, uh, the trouble with me having uh, Paul Davies as my lecturer, he's my modern physics lecturer, they were nine o'clock lectures and I barely went to any of those in my first year. Um, I never missed one! Well, I was a little bit wayward in my first I actually failed all my exams at university in my first year, apart from one. Um, and they said, look, you really can't come back in for your second year because that's not very good. So I took a whole year out, got a full time job and restudied and got back in by which time. And then obviously I, at that point, I did go to all my lectures. But I think at that but, point, Paul Davies had moved on. That was 1990. Yeah, he, uh, he Australia, moved. I think. Yeah, that's he? right. He did. Yes, he did. Because he got fed up of the Thatcher government cancelling all of his research programmes. Well, and of well. course, nobody has any use whatsoever for physics and science and astronomy and, you know, sort of gene therapy and the likes, you know, in light of what's going on. There's no value whatsoever in scientific research into say how to battling a global pandemic, is there? You've got to look at the point of view, some of the daft... Well, we make. could have a really good conversation about that because my wife is the VP of Quality and Re uh, Regulatory Affairs for a genetic company, a uh, PCR testing company, um, Quantum, in Newcastle, who had offices in the Life Centre. So, I mean, that's quite interesting. When the, the Centre for Life and the genetics labs and everything they ever set up, that brought a whole load of uh, expertise to the region. Absolutely. Did I you think... just call your wife's company? You did, Quantum didn't you? You DX. just... That was... That was just, uh, you know, can I plug David Hughes Astronomy then? Yeah, is it? Dave, yeah. David Hughes Astronomy. Have you got a website? I have, David Hughes Astronomy. There's a, there's a hint. David, David Hughes Astronomy dot. Org dot UK. There you go, everybody. So if you want to, um, I, um, 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 uh, let me see if I can find that and I'll post the link in www.david. Hughes with an E or not? Hughes with an E. Astronomy. Dot org dot uk. Not so, oh no, so that hasn't come up. Would you it's, do me a favor, David? Would you post that in the Zoom chat? I'm putting it on the screen now, which I am sharing now. Oh, David Hughes dash astronomy. Yeah, I should have said right. Okay, should I, should have said, yeah. I should have said there you go. I should have put that in. I meant to put that in, but I'm an idiot. You see, that's my my qualifications. I have a degree in idiocy as well. I would suggest that the 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 feeling for I oh know that's not worked as well. 
That's well, I thought it's there. I was there today. David Dash. Is it David Dash Hughes or David Hughes Dash? David Dash Hughes. Hang on a minute. Oh, David Just... Dash Hughes. Dash Astronomy. I am with you. Right. We can... Everybody, this is like riveting YouTube streaming. Um, <laughs> I get that. David Dash Hughes, Dash Astronomy UK. Right. I was there today. It was there Why earlier on. Get DHA.com. Yay, David Hughes, fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. Yeah, it's me. Yeah, 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 I'm a and I'm a I'm I, do you know what I love about people like you, me, and David? Uh, yeah, yeah, Dave Newton, is that we are fellows of the Royal Astronomical Society by virtue of having worked hard and got a degree in it. Yes. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of people out there who've worked hard in the amateur world of astronomy or, or, or whatever, and, and, and again, have got it and have got that fellowship and rightly deserve it. But um, it's really strange to see people who have very limited or no experience in astronomy whatsoever becoming fellows of the Royal Astronomical Society. It's because they need the money. Yeah. <laughs> um... Oh, I'm not. I'm going to get into trouble for saying. No, well, let's 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 not say anything about let's that. No, no, I mean, I don't know. So I am really proud to be a member and proud to be associated with people like yourself. And David. have we got any astronomy questions, Roy? There's no questions at all. I'm sorry. No, Gegenschein. Right. Gegenschein. Gegenschein is the thing yeah. you would. Counterglow. That's what it means. Counterglow. It's what German. It, Google it. I bet they've all gone away now. I bet all of the, the really. viewers of the, what? Gegenschein is a faintly bright spot in the night sky centered at the anti solar point. The Which is what scatter. I said. The, yeah. No, it's a back scatter of sunlight by interplanetary tree dust. That's which right. It's similar to zodiacal light. But if it's back scatter, see, zodiacal light, I think, is when the sun sets. Zodiacal light, if you can imagine the sun shines on all of this dust here in the inner planet right. uh, in between them. And then we see that on Earth here, kind of. So the anti-solar point must be the, the point in the sky that's directly immediately opposite, the Immediately opposite the sun. If yeah. you draw a straight line through yeah. the sun and the Earth, that's where it is. So, yeah, cool. Okay, well, I didn't even know that. So I even I've learned something. I've learned lots tonight, actually, especially about all these cool people. Okay. Well... Um, that's that. I really enjoyed that, and it seems that our um, very niche, limited but wonderful audience um, have enjoyed that too. And uh, just double checking. No, there are no other questions. Ian Taylor is now in the chat. Hi, David. Yeah. Great talk. Nice to hear about Herschel again. So. Again, yes. Unfortunately, Ian is one of my astronomy students, and Ian had to endure almost a full term of the Herschel dynasty. So I, I apologise, Ian, if you have vomited once more at the Herschel dynasty. I apologise, because it really went on far too long. There's such a lot to study about the Herschel. I mean, there is. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things where you could, I mean, it's not just anything, anything in astronomy. And especially when you open Wikipedia, you start reading about one thing, and then five hours later, you're still reading about it, but in yeah. really great depth. Uh-huh. And then you've got Car- Caroline, who did some phenomenal work looking. You've got John, who invent- pretty much invented photography, invented the blueprinting process. You could even argue that John Herschel, William Herschel's son, invented, did, came up with a theory of evolution ahead of Darwin. He and Darwin were wow. good friends. Um, you know, John Herschel, the whole lot of them were brilliant. Um, I mean, one of Frederick Herschel, Alexander's brother invented, um, or oh, John's brother invented fingerprinting. <laughs> and, you know, I would imagine that you're uniquely familiar with fingerprinting. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, we have one final question, which I think on, that we could end the night on. Now, you could either answer this with, you know, aliens or whatever, or mm-hmm. a genuine an answer um, about the science. Go on then. Uh, with all the rovers and everything that we have on Mars, because there's a lot of stuff going on there now, and oh, tomorrow, fingers crossed for perseverance. With the helicopter, that's a helicopter. Is that tomorrow as well? Is that? I think that one's tomorrow. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. What do you hope, David, will be discovered on Mars over the coming year? <sighs> if we don't find bacteria, some form of organisms, and we don't find something, I think Mars is best considered dead because the science of it's so concentrated on that rover its goal is to look for life not just look for geology its purpose is to look for signs of life and with the little helicopter that's buzzing around look we're done with looking at water flow 
We know water flowed on Mars a million years ago, 10 million yeah. years ago. We know there's a lot of geological evidence. All of the geology, the strata, the rocks says that water flowed and that Mars had originally had a much thicker atmosphere and it had a magnetic field as well. But was it around long enough for life to form? And that's the critical thing is that if we don't yeah. start to see something, we've seen tentative signs like methane buildup, cyclical methane buildup, which yes. implies that yeah. not a geological process, but we have yet to see the smoking gun of a little green man waving a, 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 a Roy Alexander flag or a quantum flag and going, look, we got here first. Yeah. I think if we, if we don't find it categorically, I mean, we thought we'd found signs of life in the upper atmosphere of Venus. And then that data has just been shot to pieces. Oh, but that's come back though. They've, the last it? couple of weeks, they're kind of, it's kind of coming and harring, isn't it? But it does look like, it does look like they may have over, over. Um, Egg the pudding to begin with. Yeah. No, I'm uh, sorry. I'm thinking over processed the data. That's what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. It was, I mean, who knows, you know? I mean, unless we send people there, I think it's all well and good having these robotic and uncrewed missions. But they're very limited in what they can do when faced with um, useful information. Um, I think the methane thing for, mm -hmm. for me, for Mars, does imply, I mean, if you take out the olivine, um, the potential olivine uh, geological interactions. Ta -da! Yes. Using that. If, if, you, if that's not the case, then deep microbes could, could be the case. I mean, in, on this planet, if you go around down some really deep mine shafts in 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 um, South America, there are bacteria mm -hmm. living in the walls, like a kilometer down, that live off and they create their chemistry and their energy um, from the chemicals in the rock. They don't need light. They don't need the oxygen. And exactly, what happened? Yeah. A couple, in what happened a couple of weeks ago? They were drilling down into the ice shafts. They got about a kilometer down um, through the ice shaft in Antarctica and found. A, a, a zoo of animals living around like these hot vents. Uh, Ex exactly, exactly. And, yeah. and do you know what? If they're not on Mars, they'll definitely be, and I will bet a shiny dollar on this, they will definitely be on Europa and Enceladus. I you really think? believe that. Yeah, I really do. The conditions are ripe. And they found if you, if when they when you look at the spectrographic analysis of the water that comes through the cracks on Europa and then obviously freezes, it has um, like water based salts in there. I forget the name of the actual scientific terms, but these particular chemicals can only be made when hot, salty water comes into contact with rock. And that's exactly what a hydrothermal vent is in, let's say, for example, the Atlantic Ocean. So, you know, I, th I think we will see. I think we'll I think see. we ain't gonna have to. I get the feeling we ain't gonna have to wait around, around long. Yes, for Mars. Yeah, I think true. Mars. We are gonna be. We're gonna have feet on Mars by the end of this decade, and I'll be surprised if we don't have feet on Mars by the year twenty five. 2025. I think Elon Musk is just going to get this Starship going, and he's going to be his life thing, that. isn't it? The, and the Starship stuff that goes on at Boca Chica—that's yeah. amazing. Um, the, Chris, yes, oh, the, the explosions are nice. The, the yeah. explosions are nice. The um, rapid, unscheduled disassemblies. <laughs> I think it's a technical term. Chris, yes. yes, the human body is will survive journeys to Mars, work there and return. I mean, one of the things we've learned by going on uh, living, having humans living on the International Space Station is that in some cases, um, yeah, I mean, there are some issues with eyeballs and hearts, uh, you know, the heart, heart, you know, mm -hmm. astronauts are more prone to heart disease and problems with eyes. But with the exercise regimes they have on on the on the space station and the food they eat and how healthy they are, often they come back with better muscle and bone density than they went than the, when build they build a gravity device. You build a spinning thing. Build it like, like two thousand. Like two thousand and one a space. Build thing. one of those and get it working. Yeah, I mean, if Stanley Kubrick could fake the moon landings effectively in the 1960s... Well, of course, well, of course. He faked his own death as well. He's actually working in Milton Keynes. Well, he's, he's in the other room. He's, we're doing a little yeah. secret live Zoom next, and he's, he's on. Now, listen, yeah. um, 
I think we need to go because <laughs> we could carry on like this all night and people are just leaving now in droves. Okay. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you so much, David. It is so good finally to be working with you on something and to have you here telling your story. It is wonderful. I want to thank all of our YouTube viewers. And don't forget, we've got the um, curious uh, story of the Newell Telescope tomorrow with Dave Newton. Um, we've got Aurora Hunting on Friday with Dr. Martin Kitching and Dan Pye from Kielder Observatory. We've got Lord Martin Rees, the OG astronomer, um, on Saturday night talking about, I need to email him actually to make sure we, he still knows we're doing it. Um, that we're doing a talk about life and space and so on. And then on Sunday, Sunday, that we're just there's going to be a bunch of us astronomers from the Thumbna chatting about what we love about astronomy in the Northeast. So tune in every day, seven o'clock for the next four days. Um, and we really look forward to seeing you there. But for now, I want to say thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, David. And we will see you soon. Good night. Good night.